The sun has gone down at Hangman's Hill and the ghost at Misery Corner isn't walking tonight. So, welcome to the Weird Tales Radio Show, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. And now, here's your host, writer, award-winning journalist, best-selling author and sometime werewolf hunter, Charles Christian. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Weird Tales Radio Show with me, Charles Christian. Thank you so much for tuning in again for more chronicles of weird tales in weird times. We're getting into the Christmas spirit in this week's show with our interviews, along later in the show, but first, Christmas nostalgia. You know, that feeling Christmases are no longer what they used to be, how they were so much better when you were younger. And if you talk to your parents and grandparents, they'll tell you exactly the same thing. Things ain't what they used to be. All of which is a little sad, as actually the Christmases of old weren't all that brilliant. And certainly here in the UK, from what I can remember of my youth in the 1950s, they were inevitably accompanied by power cuts in the middle of cooking Christmas lunch. And the television even then managed to play repeats. What's also intriguing is this Christmas nostalgia is not a new thing. Charles Dickens wrote about it in his story A Christmas Carol, which was first published in 1843. Yes, 180 years ago. And when you go back to the early 17th century, so we're now looking 400 years, people even then were complaining that Christmases weren't as good as they were in the good old days. But... What I can tell you about the Christmases of my youth is that the toys us boys received for Christmas were a lot more dangerous than the toys on sale today. In my ninth year, my father bought me a rifle for Christmas, a real one. OK, that's a bit excessive and with hindsight I realise my father wasn't exactly a responsible adult. In fact, my whole family were on the spectrum of being dysfunctional. Then there was the time they bought me a chemistry set real acid to play with, and of course add in some iron filings and you can ruin your family's Christmas by making the kitchen smell of rotten eggs. And let's not also forget the time they bought me a miniature live steam engine. In the UK they were made by, and in fact still are made by, a company called Mamod. They now come with solid fuel tablets, but in the earlier ones they had a rather more dangerous affair involving cotton wool soaked in either white spirit or methylated spirits. No, I didn't spoil my family's Christmas by setting the house on fire. That was actually my chain-smoking father's party piece. But I did manage to set myself on fire, but only a little bit, not so you'd notice. But one toy I would have definitely loved, but it was taken off the market while I was still a toddler, was the Gilbert Atomic Energy Lab. Only available from 1951 to 1952, this science kit for children included four types of uranium ore. Yes, genuine uranium ore. A Geiger counter and a comic called Dagwood Splits the Atom, as well as a coupon for ordering more radioactive materials. Why was it withdrawn after one year, you ask? Well, one of the four uranium ores included was PO210, otherwise known as polonium, which by mass is 250,000 times more toxic than hydrogen cyanide. Polonium, you say? That rings a bell. Oh yes, wasn't that the stuff the Russian secret service used to murder the Russian dissident Alexander Litvienko in London in 2006? And wasn't there also a suggestion that the former Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat also died from polonium poisoning? Yes, folks, radiation, the gift that keeps on giving. A present your child will never forget receiving. And no batteries needed, ever. Not when you are dealing with a substance that has a half-life of 24,000 years. Time for this week's interviews. We have two of them for you. We start with Teresa Taylor talking about the Lords of Misrule, a peculiar medieval yuletide tradition that we probably all enjoy seeing revived again, although possibly without the antics of some modern-day politicians. Our guest, 
Teresa Taylor is a scholar in the field of French religious history and the author of a biography of St. Bernadette of Lourdes. She writes on folklore and cultural studies in publications including Fortean Times and Hellebore. Teresa, the Lords of Misrule, the article you've just written for Fortean Times, it's an intriguing concept because I think a lot of us are aware of pagan Christmas Saturnalia in Roman times, but then tend to think it all became very much church services and prim and proper in Christian times. But Lords of Misrule, it's really a bit of a throwback. Do you think that? It does seem like it. Yes, yes. Um, uh, I I have a... a for a long time, um, religious historians understood such rites to be that slowly, very slowly fading pagan presence in, in Europe that went on for about a 1,000 years, mm-hmm. which is natural when you consider that right up until the 19th century, um, illiteracy was quite normal. Yes. Um, you know, it, it's not like they um, were able to get everyone thinking the same. Mm. Um, and so I think it is, I, I do see it as vestigial paganism. And in a paradoxical way, I think that it is also part of a vigorous early Christian belief, which was that Christianity and faith shines brighter if it is set against its opposite, Um, which is why with medieval Christians they were quite happy to do things that seem to us outrageous, like leading an ass around the cathedral and that during carnival time and just everything being outrageous and riotous and dirty and stupid. Um, And then you go back into your proper roles all the more refreshed from having this uh, letting off steam. Um, And it wasn't until the early modern era, significantly I think when people are getting more literate, that people really started to think, no, this is ridiculous and you can't have it and they start stamping it out. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you see that not just so much with Christmas, but with things like carnivals and fairs, particularly in England. It was the Victorians who squashed a lot of those elements because they were rowdy and they were disreputable people and, you know, people were getting drunk and having a good time and doing all manner of uh, things and the prim, proper, upper-middle-class Victorians really frowned on it and squashed down a lot of folklore, folkloric-type activities around that time, didn't they? They did, didn't they? Yes. And they'd allow a few um, to remain, but very denatured. Mm. Yeah, I think what's lost there a bit is the um, high spirits, especially for young men, Mm -hmm. um, that they fit in most. If they don't have those um, rowdy moments, as you say, um, I think it, um, it robs them of their cultural presence. Yes, because you, you know, it was a, a thing in rural areas that they would have these very long and fairly violent games of football between rival villages that would just roam all over. And again, all of those went in the 19th century and you're just left with a few, in England, a few relics like the cheese rolling competitions and things which allow young men to risk breaking their neck, running down hills, chasing a piece of cheese, you know, letting off steam and communal fun. Tell us about some of the things that happened with the more chaotic Lords of Misrule Christmases. I mean, for a start, who was the Lord of Misrule? Who who got appointed? What was that person's role? Um, Yes, the the Lords of Misrule um, were... Uh, elected into their position um, and were usually um, people who were of what one would say the middling sort, um, upper servants and people like that, um, who could direct the fun um, effectively, uh, but it was very thrilling and amazing to see them in positions of authority lording it over their betters. Mm -hmm. 
that was and in the university towns the lords of misrule were always a student Mm -hmm. uh, with the professors (laughs) having to um, yield to them Um, and at the king's court however uh, that's the most structured lords of misrule um, is that uh, were sometimes courtiers therefore perhaps a bit above um, yeah. the rest of the Lords of Misrule. But they were always people who were low enough that it was very funny. To, just seeing them in authority was funny enough. Yeah. Um, and, of course, then he'd, he'd get up in strange gear and um, and sometimes wearing a woman's dress, which is, of course, absolutely hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> Cheap <laughs> fun. <laughs> and, um, and, and start laying about um, with these things. But the election, um, there is only one person elected um, and he is a Lord of Misrule. It's always a young man, um, even if there's cross-dressing. Um, and in the continental societies, they, they were sometimes called the mothers of stupidity, etc. but they're always men. Yeah. Um, and he's always a singular figure. Um, there's not half a dozen of them. Um, he commands other people, but he is just one person and the centre of attention. Um, and it goes on for 12 days um, from... Christmas Eve um, Mm -hmm. through to Twelfth Night, Epiphany. And what era did this cover? When did it it start and when did it start petering out? We're not sure of the origins, but it is an established um, tradition by the medieval era. Mm -hmm. Um, So it seems to have um, come through um, with the early Middle Ages and the – it – interlinks with carnival customs and with the presence of monasticism uh, because often the Lord of Misrule was both a clerical, anti-clerical figure, uh, which would gain meaning only from the presence of um, the ecclesiastical institutes in society. So I I think that he's coming from the early Middle Ages along with a lot of other uh, carnival traditions Mm -hmm. and he becomes a visible, well-known figure um, by the Middle Ages where and because the Lord of Misrule was often depicted in art, mm-hmm. especially in the cheeky little marginalias clowning right. about and so forth, yeah. Yeah. And by 1500, we're getting into the early modern era and the uh, Lord of Misrule has his critics then, so um, it's it's the resistance is up, but... Of course, he wouldn't have attracted so many criticisms if it wasn't a widespread by then, very widespread, very well known and seen as traditional. Everyone, yeah. no one could remember where it came from. It had always been there. Was it when it started to go, was it really the Reformation and the rise of the Puritans who we generally have been left, left to history with a reputation of being completely against any form of fun and enjoyment? Um, yes, um, the Puritans have that well-earned reputation, <laughs> um, and uh, they know that, that it's true that uh, the Puritans were opponents of misrule. They were even opponents, of course, of ordinary Christian Christmas festivities, yes. um, much less of um, parodies and inversions. But by the time the Puritans had arrived, um, there had been about a hundred years of disapproval um, of misrule and a slow decline. Um, where Miss, the Lord of Misrule no longer uh, is at the court after um, the later Tudors, mm-hmm. Mary Tudor and Elizabeth Tudor, I have never comes back. It's interesting that the Lord of Misrule, it's, his last summer in the courts was with the Tudor King Edward and there's all different um, explanations have been offered, but I think that during the reign of a child king, is almost a time of misrule itself. No wonder we saw a lot of a lot of the Lord of Misrule there. Yeah. Um, yeah. But after that, um, reformers are coming in, but Catholic reformers were quite as opposed to misrule as any any amount of Protestants. Right. Um, yes, both of them are getting into a more serious institutional um, form of religion, and they both crack down on it very effectively. Right. But because you, you say that, but, the, I mean, there was in ecclesiastical or at least cathedral towns an abbot of misrule or something, wasn't there, where they would, a choir boy would, or someone of junior like that would be the Lord of Misrule. Yes, yes. that, that the, the choir schools um, uh, kept it up 
and the election of the boy bishop, the, yeah. the ban bishop, um, the abbot of unreason, um, which is a very charming custom. Um, but and so the church there is absolutely um, sustaining a misrule tradition. Um, however, those kinds of ceremonies um, got toned down a lot in the 16th century. It became um, a greater simplicity about the boy bishop figure, um, less riotousness, less frivolity. Um, and then um, with the coming of the Reformation, um, they, the boy bishop is phased out in most of the cathedral towns in England. But at the same time in France, um, the the riotous displays when children would take over the churches on certain holy days, such as the Holy Innocence Day, mm -hmm. um, were also reformed out of existence. So in both the Catholic and the Protestant worlds, um, the boy bishop went the way of the Lord of Misrule. But he has not entirely disappeared. Apparently it was still maintained in some parts of the Mediterranean world, of Spain and Italy, much slower to change. Mm -hmm. has, and has been uh, reintroduced in the 20th century um, as I think it's a very charming custom um, and uh, gi giving, making children, instead of being marginalised, they become the centre of attention, that they have, um, they have a, a vital role to play. What's intriguing, I've seen a report here that supposedly... King James I of England, sometime around about 1616, was talking about the fact that the old school Christmas traditions had fallen away. And you certainly in your Fortean Times article have a, a piece by a, a mention of English writer John Taylor in his complaint about Christmas saying, you know, saying the same thing that the the good old days of um, general hospitality uh, have all faded away. I mean, it's it's intriguing because in the present day uh, you get people doing the if you like the Christmas lament, saying you know it's too commercial. In in the good old days we <laughs> used to have it like this, but it would appear that. For hundreds of years, people have always been saying, oh, the Christmases aren't like they used to be. It's it's an yes. intriguing thing, isn't it? It's this sort of whole myth of Merry England, isn't it? That That is amusing. Century after century, Christmas has always fallen away from what it's meant to be. What happened to the spirit of Christmas? Yeah. We never seem to, no one seems to live up to it ever. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, yes. Um, and uh, yeah, that that is a notable thing um, that what you were saying of um, King James um, and and he very much being um, a person that um, uh, didn't like to see traditions damped down. Um, although it's easy to say, well, there's always a merrier Christmas in the past where the community was more together. Um, both King James and the um, complaint of Christmas writer are perhaps pointing to the early arrival of modernity where people celebrated in their own homes with hand-picked companions mm -hmm. rather than out on the street with right. the whole community. Mm. Yes, and uh, once again you see that with the Christmas uh, wassailing and mumming and people out on the streets collecting money and food and the like and the way, again, that's faded away and... Um, is just a few relics surviving now, those customs. Because, um, I mean, one of the things it does appear was that the wealthier people would throw open their halls and allow all comers in there, and there would be general entertainment and um, hosting for the community. Is that sort of a correct perception or is that one of those, again, the Merry England and it never really actually happened? It was just we like to think it did. I think it did happen, yes. Um, uh, um, uh, I, I think that there was an obligation um, on landed nobility who, of course, lived in the regions for most of the year yeah. up until the 16th century um, to... Um, at least make some general feasting. Um, 
Uh, of course, I doubt if it ever was as good as it was remembered. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, yes. Um, but I think that was one of those um, uh, obligations of feudalism, um, which the market economy and the more fluid um, arrangements then wiped out. Yes. Oh, well, not wiped out, but gra- drastically declined, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Of course, I was forgetting the feudalism element and the decline of feudalism, yes. With the Lords of Misrule, the actual individuals, just how much misrule could they get away with or were they always conscious of the fact that once the 12 days of Christmas were over they would be back to their normal lowly positions and um, some people might bear grudges if they took too many liberties? That's a very good point, yes. Um, uh, What were the constraints um, on his power? Um, It appears that there was some consciousness um, that uh, they, that you couldn't go too far. They would sometimes behave outrageously and humiliate their betters. Um, and of course, it's part of the setup is that as the nobleman or the other person, you've got to take it well. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's like those um, uh, like uh, school festivities, etc. The person who's being mocked has to um, yeah. show a proper character. Um, However, um, the Lords of Misrule rarely became violent. That physical violence is the um, the barrier. It happens happens violence at carnivals in some European um, examples, and in those cases, the authorities really came down on them hard afterwards. Yeah, Um, French kings, you know, sending in. Uh, troops just to hang miscreants, etc. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, the the misrule um, was um, very free in terms of consumption mm-hmm. and very free in terms of um, uh, bawdiness and decorum yes. and of speech, yes. a very rare time of freedom of speech, but not of action. Yes. Um, people did have to keep that distance between their betters and themselves, even during misrule. Yeah. And, of course, the, the consumption thing I think is quite important, again, which links to feudalism, which is the genuine generosity of the traditional Christmas of festivity as a festival for everyone, um, was more or less based on, and perhaps this is linked to wassailing, et cetera, as well, that you'd have a lot of product um, which belonged to you as your property, but the food and drink had to be consumed. Uh, it There wasn't as much market um, until the early modern era. You couldn't send stuff away. If you've slaughtered three oxen, you may yeah. as well invite everyone in to feast. Yeah, because they're going to go um, off. Because yeah. <laughs> they're going to go off. And you've probably got piles of apples and goodness knows what. Um, the market economy is going to reorganise that. Um, but the right to be greedy and eat far too much and eat all the foods not allowed in the church's fasting periods is a very, very strong aspect of misrule. And, of course, we take eating and drinking for granted. Mm. Um, But in those communities, um, to have a rare season where you could snatch all the food off the master's table um, was uh, uh, very transgressive, very enjoyable, very different from ordinary life. Yeah, that's an an intriguing point. Yes, you you, you Mm. forget things like... uh, you know, how different life was if you uh, didn't have a deep freezer or a refrigerator. I suppose the last modern references you get to the Lords of Misrule or, you know, the traditional Christmases crop up in Dickens' Christmas Carol with the ghost of Christmas past when he's sort of showing the the good old days and the partying at um, Scrooge's employers and harking back to a... Um, well, well, I mean, the whole of the, the the Christmas Carol at the ending as well is very much let's all be merry and share with among each other. Uh, was was that Dickens? You think trying to get the message across to the Prima Victorians that um, you know the community spirit was still needed? I think it was. Yes, yes. I think that Charles Dickens was trying to tap into that tradition of celebration in English culture. And I think that he is trying to um, curb 
um, the Industrial Revolution's idea that everyone should work all day, every day. Mm-hmm. Um, that uh, And if you have something like Christmas, well, a half day off would be sufficient. Yes. And and the, the idea that that will crush the soul um, as well as being quite a miserable way to live, yeah. Yeah. That you'll you'll die and, and <laughs> you've never enjoyed your life. Um, that's pretty what – that's the threat, isn't it, that, that Scrooge faces, realising that, yeah. Yes. Yeah, and again, that um, thing's now where we – scratch her head at some of the lines in Christmas Carol where he, you know, asking for the day off or coming in only for half a day. We forget that, as you say, people worked pretty much all day, every day. And there. Are there are there any communities, you know, around the world where the tradition still is maintained of the Lords of Misrule, has it, has it passed around as the Europeans have spread across the planet? Have any of those traditions been maintained anywhere? Or is it now purely something for the history books? I've not been able to find um, any Lords of Misrule um, anywhere, which doesn't, they might be somewhere, especially in places like colonies mm-hmm. and that. Um, the, the child bishop... Um, is still in existence and has even made a return. But the laws of misrule um, are, are not um, at the moment anywhere that, that anywhere that I could find them. Um, they uh, The last ones that I could um, trace were in the 19th century and um, with employers um, coming down hard on the idea. <laughs> that, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, get everyone gone lazy, slovenly and dirty. Um, for weeks instead of coming back to work. Yeah. Um, yes. Although um, the, I reckon the Lord of Misrule is um, uh, is only banished. Um, is it's an ever living figure, like most folkloric figures. I think can come back to us. Um, and um, the, although um, the Lord of Misrule um, appears to have um, gone away with a lot of other sacrificial figures, I think it could be revived in the future. You know, like the Krampus, um, mm. which nearly died out, has come back. Yes. Um, so perhaps someone will bring back the Lord of Misrule in our time. Yes, I think we could probably enjoy that and um, bring that back. Now, you just mentioned just now the sacrifice element because James Fraser in The Golden Bow, he has this idea that the men who were exalted, I'm quoting from your article here, were then killed during the rites of Saturn. And I mean, in sort of modern terms, that's very much an element running under movies like The Wicker Man, isn't it? This this belief that the pagans sacrificed a leader for the good of the land. Is there anything in that or is that a sort of slightly Victorian Edwardian wishful thinking view on, on anthropology? It, um, I believe that the, um, the sacrificial um, Saturnalia figure, um, uh, like um, Frazier, who's gone so, so much out of fashion, uh, the Golden Bough, but I, I don't think, I, I actually think he did have many valid insights. And I agree with his statement that um, one can see a continuity um, with these figures, the Summer Lord, the Lord of the Bean, all the rest of them, hmm. um, and the, the sacrificial figure. Um, and the indulgence with which the Lord of Misrule is treated um, uh, in that case would have its origins in the pagan idea that you give him everything uh, because you're going to take his life. Hmm. Um, and... Uh, the people, of course, in, in Dark Ages Britain, where you still had the ship burials and the Saxon religions and that, they would have been aware of that. Um, and it perhaps filtered through, um, I believe. Um, but I've got to admit, um, as I, no- I note in my article, that historians now say that two two things are entirely um, separate and the folklorists were making easy equivalences. Um, but given the mystery of how our beliefs are formed over time, Mm-hmm. Um, and how they're transmitted, uh, I don't think anybody can can ever be absolutely sure. And it is true, I think, the way that the Lord of Misrule is always a young man, mm-hmm. um, again, links it 
to that sort of um, sacrificial tradition. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I do, th- I do see something in that. But I've got to admit that I'm uh, perhaps I'm in a declining minority. Um, the historians now uh, don't see that, but who knows? Um, uh, the pendulum can swing again in these interpretations, and yeah. Indeed, I mean, I've I've read recently that some of the bodies in the bog that have been discovered that the view is changing on them whether or not they were murder victims or sacrificial victims or what. As you say, it it, it does the pendulum does swing, and um, in twenty years' time, we may have an entirely different perspective on it all. So yes, no, that was fascinating. I particularly liked your suggestion that uh, perhaps the Lord of Misrule might come back one day. Um, maybe Christmas next year, when if hopefully if COVID's out of the way. <laughs> uh, yes, um, I, I think I'm not the only one groaning in 2020 that I feel like he's already come in, the Lord of Misrule. He's, <laughs> he's running things permanently. Yes. Um, uh, Boris Johnson was, has often been compared to the Lord of Misrule. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, you, you, if I kept finding him when I was doing my word searches, and for, <laughs> for good reason. Um, but um, uh, the, the funny thing is, isn't it, that this is a custom which, even in its remote vestiges, was um, very rare by the early nineteenth century. But no one needs to have it explained to them. When you mm. say Lord of Misrule, people know what you're talking about. Thus. Uh, Boris Johnson, the hanging that moniker on him was very easy. Yes. Um, so that shows that it must be a very strong presence in culture. There's something there that's well remembered and therefore must be meaningful. Yes, we just like the idea of a bit of chaos and disorganisation in, a, in uh, what seems to be an increasingly regulated, monitored, straight-laced society. Just just a little bit of chaos there. Except, of course, in the UK, depending on how Brexit talks, it may be a little bit more chaos than we want. <laughs> mm. Yes, yes, Britain is, is facing some some choppy, choppy seas there and we're all wishing the British well that you get through all this OK. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think a lot of people are secretly laughing up their sleeve at it, though. <laughs> Anyway, a fascinating conversation and um, thank you ever so much for your time, Teresa. Thank you. You're listening to The Weird Tales Radio Show with Charles Christian. Now for our second interview. And we're talking to one of this show's regulars, the author, blogger and poet Morgan Daimler, who this week is discussing the intriguing question of whether fairies and aliens are related. We've had people on this show talking about being abducted by aliens, but their experiences are very similar to tales of encounters with fairies from 150 years ago. So is this purely a coincidence, or are they merely two sides of the same coin? I've recently bought your book New Dictionary of Fairies, a 21st century exploration of the Celtic and related Western European fairies. And I was intrigued in there that you have a little piece on the connection between fairies and aliens, where you make some very lucid points and think that how come back in the olden days people saw fairies, but very few report them now, but suddenly lots of people report aliens? And are they the same thing and it's just simply been updated with media and everything else? It's, it's an intriguing question. And it's, it's one of those things, uh, as I, I say in the beginning of that portion of the book, if you ask one community... <laughs> of people um, that have an interest that focuses more on aliens and uh, and UFOs and such, uh, they'll be very adamant that across history it's always been aliens, that humans have just misunderstood them. But if you ask people who are more um, into the, the fairy folklore, uh, it's, it's the exact opposite view. It, it is, you know, that they... Um, 
the fairies as such have always kind of been around humanity. And now that we have this new concept, this idea of extraterrestrials, they're sort of taking on that, uh, that appearance, that genre to um, continue to do what they've always done, <laughs> basically. Yes, I mean, there are a few... Uh, we also know the obviously the television ancient aliens and type things, but uh, <laughs> yes. yes, exactly. And there are a few odd sketches from the late Middle Ages of etchings of things in the sky, but are a bit vague what they are. But I say I, I was intrigued by the fact that the fairies seem to fade out sometime in the sort of late forties, early fifties when. Mm-hmm. The sci-fi movies come along and the first alien stories and suddenly things from the stars. Yeah, the the timing is really fascinating. And I think that's what sort of led me to the conclusion that I had reached, um, you know, which is that it is, it's right about the 40s and 50s, we start to see fairies really being strongly relegated, particularly in, in popular culture and mass media to sort of the domain of children and, mm-hmm. you know, these, these twee little um, nature spirits that are, are kind of helpful, but also it's sort of powerless in a lot of stories. Um, they usually what we find, you know, sort of in that, that era in artwork and in fiction is the idea of fairies going to humans for help to try to get the human to help them with something. Um, which is of course very different from the older folklore, but yes. once you kind of take out that idea of, you know, fairies as being, you know, potentially a little dangerous and and definitely powerful and and having this ability to kind of come in and abduct people and, um, you know, have people disappear for days at a time because they're away with the fairies and then, you know, come back. It it kind of creates this void, (laughs) if you Mm. will. Um, And it was right around that same time that science fiction started really taking off. And as you said, the movies um, were really starting to come out in that period, that sort of post-World War II period. Um, And that's when we start to see the first reports of uh, what are classified as UFO sightings. And then I think it's the, the early 1960s, 1961, that we have the first um, reported case of an alien abduction. You know, mm. and the the similarities in the stories themselves, if you took out, you know, who was supposed to be doing what, um, the, the actual mechanics of what are happening are, are kind of strikingly similar <laughs> between yeah, the two. Because, I mean, one of the things, and we've discussed this before with fairies, is mm-hmm. the fact there's this time distortion thing goes on that you know somebody yep. goes away um for for a night they think they've gone away for a night and when they get back you know a year has gone by or seven mm-hmm. years has gone by and there's this similar time change effect with alien abductions that people yep. think they've been gone a very long time but then they realize it's only been minutes or uh, or the other way around oh, the other yeah. way around yeah 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 um yeah no and that's um that in particular because it's such a a specific detail that we find with both um you know the idea that you could um you know join the fairies for what might seem to you to be a few hours and then come back and it's been days and everyone's been wondering where you are um, and then we see the same thing with some of the UFO abductions where, you know, a person thinks it's been minutes and then they, it's been the entire night. Or um, one of the more famous cases uh, we had over here, uh, a gentleman, I think he was with a logging crew in the woods and um, he was gone for three days, I think it was. And he thought it had only been hours, hmm. um, you know, so that idea that whatever's taking you wherever you're being taken the the time the concept of time itself works differently yeah there compared to here there's yeah. also i suppose the i mean nowadays people are talking about dozens of different types of alien but they are slightly some of the descriptions they're slightly elfin mm-hmm. thin smaller than typical humans, which, of course, Mm -hmm. 
describes a lot of elves and the fae, doesn't it? Yep. Yeah. Um, as you said, now we see kind of an abundance of different descriptions that people have, but particularly the older ones, the, the original ones that people would describe. Um, they're not entirely identical to what we would find in fairy lore, which tend to be a little more human, but definitely similar sizing, um, three to feet three to four feet tall, I think is a pretty common description of, of some of the, the older aliens that people were encountering, Mm -hmm. which is similar to a lot of fairy lore, particularly through like France and, um, parts of England. Mm. And, um, the idea that they, they, um, looked somewhat human, but clearly not human, Mm. Uh, you know, oversized eyes or, or large heads or, you know, certain features that just kind of stood out. Um, but it just, it's, it's so fascinating to me the way that um, even these alien encounters when people are first having them, there's still something to them that implies these aliens are, are somewhat humanoid. You know, they have yes. two legs, they have two arms, they have a head, they have a face. Um, as you said, yes. maybe not so much in, in some of the more modern encounters. Um, yeah. It, there, there's something relatable to them, which is definitely something we see with the fairies as well. This, this idea that they would um, reach out to people, even though there were things about them that were distorted or disturbing or inhuman. Um, there was enough of that humanity in them uh, that people would uh, have some kind of resonance or connection. So it's, yeah. it's definitely really interesting. And of course, one of the phrases often used to describe aliens is little green men. And <laughs> yep. we have the famous 12th century case of the green children of Woolpit yep. uh, in England, where two children are found in mysterious circumstances with green skin. There's a number of theories about what they, where they came from, including whether they were the fae or whether they were suffering from some kind of food poisoning and were actually just um, refugees from a war that was going on. But that it also fits in, you know, were these, of, was, was this one of the earliest ever alien encounters? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the crossover... It's certainly fascinating. Um, And yeah, we have the whole little green men versus, you know, green being the fairy's color. Um, So it's it's another correlation between the two, the two systems. Um, And yeah, the the green children of Wolpit is is such an interesting story uh, because they they never did figure out for sure where the children had come from. Mm. As you said, there's a lot of theories. Um, The boy, of course, died. Um, yeah. shortly after uh but the the girl lived and grew up and um you know could never really offer an explanation for where they'd come from except they'd gotten lost in some caves yeah and come out near the town um yeah it's just very interesting yes bit that always intrigues me is that the um, the girl subsequently married a lawyer which yeah. <laughs> says something i'm not quite sure what <laughs> Yeah, I agree. Um, when we look, oh, I was going to say, when we look at, you know, at other points of comparison, um, you know, people talk in, in UFO encounters about seeing lights. Um, there was a famous one, actually, I believe it was in England, uh, at a, a military base where the soldiers who were on patrol had seen lights in the trees. Yes. And when they went to to kind of investigate, they, they ended up having a, a bit of a, a alien UFO adventure. Yes. <laughs> Trying to track that down. But um, that's so similar to a lot of what we have with fairy lore, with the idea of um, fairies appearing as lights, people seeing them as lights, uh, moving across the ground or moving in the trees. Um, fairies are known to leave fairy rings where they've been dancing, which uh, people tend to immediately think of the mushroom circles. But it that does also include circles of dead grass or mm. circles of very green grass. And the same thing UFOs um, yeah. are supposed to at the landing sites leave these circular marks. Um, so, yeah, there's so many layers of crossover in the beliefs. Yes, the, 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 you're referring to the Rendlesham Forest 
case, which yeah. is UK's most celebrated UFO encounter. And a lot of people have basically made their career on it for the last 40 years. <laughs> I think they'd be very upset if they say yeah. it wasn't aliens after all, it was the fae you saw. <laughs> Well, I, I won't go so far as to say that then. I don't want to upset anyone, but I will just say it. It's, um, it was, it's very similar to yeah. what we find in, in fairy lore stories. So, um, yeah, and that, that is, I don't want to get into a retelling of that. You could probably do a better job retelling it than I could anyway, but, um, that was quite an interesting experience. Uh, and it's particularly for me when you have encounters where it's military personnel, because they're they're seen as being more reliable mm, mm. as sources, um, and it was more than one person yes. who had the experience. So yeah, I, I can see why it's held people's attention for forty years. <laughs> well, we haven't had any more significant ones since then, so it's the only one we've got, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, that's a good one, though. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is. Anyway, are there any other similarities or crossovers between aliens and uh, the Fey? There are, there are. Um, it's pretty common in fairy lore to hear stories of um, people who are taken or, you know, who encounter fairies being offered food. And uh, usually it's, you know, in the fairy beliefs, it's a bad idea to take it, food or drink, because mm -hmm. it'll sort of trap you in their world. But we have quite a lot of stories relating to it. And in some cases, um, you know, when it's offered and you refuse, their reaction's bad and they will try to sort of force you to take it. And interestingly, we also see that in some um, UFO and alien encounters, people being offered food, um, sometimes food-like items, I guess yeah. you would say. Not, not things that we would necessarily recognize as food, but, um, and the same thing if it's refused, sort of getting this violent reaction, um, so that's a particularly interesting crossover. Uh, there's a good book called Trojan Feast by Joshua Cutchins that, that gets into this in much more depth. Um, but, uh, I think that's one of the crossovers between the two, between fairies and, and aliens that people are the least aware of, that there's right. food connections to both. Yeah. Uh, and then of course the, the actual abductions, um, you know, with fairies, sometimes it's it's rather pleasant. Um, sometimes it's decidedly not. Uh, sometimes the person would be returned or would escape and have physical marks on them, things like that. Um, there's a particular type of fairy that's associated with sleep paralysis. And when we look at aliens and, and UFO abductions, we find very similar things. The, you know, some people who have been taken and then returned and tell their stories describe it as being a, a fairly pleasant experience, um, almost euphoric sometimes. And other people, it's horrific. It's a sort mm. of nightmare, you yes. know. Um, some people come back with marks. Some people come back with, um, you know, either bruises or scratches or, or literal like physical yeah. um physical issues because of it. Um, the sleep paralysis is a very common thing as far as I'm aware with UFO abductions. The person becoming conscious but not being able to move yep, yep. Um, or, or do anything about what's happening. Um, you know, so those are all points of crossover where we find pretty much those same stories in the fairy lore um, as we then find later in the UFO material and what interests me, like I'd said earlier, is if you take out the um, the name of what's doing it, if you remove the word fairy or you remove the word alien and just tell the story, you would be hard pressed sometimes to guess which word had been taken out. <laughs> Any other things that uh, we should look out for when we're wondering whether we're encountering an alien or the fae? Um, I mean, I think we covered all the major crossover points. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's one of those subjects that will probably always be a point of debate. Um, cause clearly we're never going to know for certain hmm. what's, what's really going on with a lot of this. But, um, if you're interested in either, you know, fairies or, um, aliens, it's, it's a really interesting subject to look at sort of this, um, postmodern crossover that we have going on. And, you know, of course, the idea that the fairies have this sort of magic that can fool human senses and therefore could kind of present whatever 
image they wanted to present or, you know, make you think you were in whatever environment Mm. they wanted you to think you were in. Which again, you hear with alien abduction cases. Yep. So it's, um, it's one of those subjects once you start sort of looking into it, it's, it's so intriguing. I think it sort of pulls you in. (laughs) Right. Well, I won't take up any more of your time. Morgan Daimler, as ever, a delight talking to you. Always good talking to you as well. Take care. The Visit It was a bitterly cold Christmas Eve as the old man made his way along the dark, deserted, snow-filled streets. And yet although the streets appeared empty, he felt sure he could occasionally hear footsteps behind him. And yet every time he stopped to see who was following, there was no one there, just the mist swirling around and the coldness of his breath visible, but no person. Of course, everyone was warm inside, as he too longed to be. And yet, when he walked on, those echoing footsteps would start pursuing him again. And so it was with much relief that he finally arrived at his lodgings, as the church clock struck eight. As he opened the door, He could see the flicker of a welcoming fire from his sitting room, and he smiled at the thoughtfulness of his landlady to have lit it for his return. After hanging his coat and removing his cold wet boots, he went to warm himself by the fire and was shocked to find that he wasn't alone. There, sitting by the flickering flames, was his dear old friend from school days. My goodness! Albert, is that really you? Oh, how many years has it been? Too many, my friend. Apologies for the intrusion, but I... I felt I couldn't let another Christmas pass without seeing you and... and without catching up. Well, of course, the old man was delighted and the questions tumbled out of him. Was it my landlady who let you in? How long have you been waiting? Have you travelled far? You must be exhausted and hungry. Oh, there's me thinking I'd be spending my usual Christmas alone. Welcome, welcome and Merry Christmas. Let me make you something to eat and fix you a drink. Mulled wine? And so it was, the two old friends ate, drank, talked and laughed together well into the early hours of Christmas morning. Ah, it's far too late for you to travel now, said the old man. Why don't you stay? You must have the bed and and I, I will be most comfortable here on the sofa. You could spend Christmas Day with me too. Oh, of course, unless you have somewhere you must be. (laughs) His friend thanked him and said that it would be very kind of him, but not to worry with giving up his bed, for he would be very happy to sit by the fire with a blanket. For I feel the cold more these days, my friend. And so it was that the two old friends retired for what remained of the night. Next morning, the old man woke early, but he was surprised to find that when he went into the sitting room, his guest had left without waking him and without saying goodbye. He thought it strange and was disappointed to not have company after all for Christmas Day. Well, a few days later, the old man was remembering how wonderful it was to catch up with his friend, and he wondered if perhaps Albert would like to come and spend New Year with him. So he fetched out his old address book and found the last contact number that he'd had for Albert. A woman answered the phone. Oh, uh, I'm sorry to bother you, but I, I wonder, would this be the right number for Albert? Albert Monk. I'm an old friend, Ernie. Oh, uh, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, Ernie. But, 
Albert passed away recently. Oh, my goodness, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, that must have been very sudden. Well, of course, Ernie was confused. Had Albert had an accident on the way home from leaving him? Oh, no, said the woman. He had been ill for some time. He passed away quietly. Here at home. At eight o'clock on Christmas Eve. He often spoke of how he would have loved to have met up with you again. Here again. Here again. And that's it. We're almost out of time. Once again, a big thank you to our guest, Teresa Taylor. You can find her on Twitter at Teresa Taylor 12 and Morgan Daimler, who is on Amazon and Twitter, on Twitter at Morgan Daimler. Right, before we go, here's our final thought for the show, courtesy of the evolutionary biologist E.O. Wilson in his 2012 book, The Social Conquest of Earth, in which he writes... We have created a Star Wars civilization with Stone Age emotions, medieval institutions and godlike technology. Which is a polite way of saying the human race is basically a bunch of chimpanzees who have Darth Vader's Death Star at their disposal. And on that cheery note, let's mention next time. As we head into the holidays, we'll be doing special best of shows for both Christmas and New Year weeks and then back to our normal format after that. The specials are going to be great fun to listen to, not so much Christmas shows as Crowley Mass shows, as uh, our old friend Alistair Crowley will be making appearances both in both shows, along with evil archaeology and pop culture. So what's not to love there? Now it just remains for me to say this is Charles Christian saying thank you for listening in. Please join me again next time. Until then, stay well, stay weird. Goodbye. Black Shuck, the demon dog of East Anglia, is baying at the moon. Which means it's time for us to go. You've been listening to the Weird Tales radio show with Charles Christian, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. You can keep in touch with us online at www.weirdtalesradio.com by email to weirdtales at icloud.com and on Twitter at Christian Uncut. Join us again next week for another edition of the Weird Tales radio show. Good night.